So let's uh, let's just get rolling here into this thing, starting with step two, and pick up where we left off last week. Let's turn to page 59, and let's read step two, where it says, "Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity." Now, when I first took the second step, I had expectations. <laughs> I had I had expectations of being returned to sanity. And I was gravely disappointed when I was not. Because I thought that that's what the second step meant, that I would be returned to sanity. But notice that the authors say, could restore us to sanity. And to give you a glimpse of what to look forward to, we're going to jump ahead just for a moment and turn to page 84. Page 84, paragraph Three, page 84, paragraph 3. Now, at this time in the book, we are at step 10. So when we get to step 10, which implies we've already done an inventory, we've taken the exact nature of our wrongs to God in step 6 and 7. We've compiled our list of people we've harmed, and we're actively making amends. So providing we've done that, This is what we are going to experience in step 10. Notice what it says in that paragraph. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time, sanity will have returned. (laughs) So, if you're anything like me and you have the delusion that your sanity is going to be returned simply by choosing a, a power greater than yourself, I was gravely mistaken when that happened. So just keep that in mind. Let's turn to page 44. Page 44 is the chapter we agnostics. This chapter is entirely devoted to step two. Notice what the authors have to say in in the first paragraph. It says, in the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. Notice where they pick up, right where we left off on page 43. The authors are recapping what we've learned up to this point. In other words, am I clear on what a real alcoholic is? Am I clear on what a non-alcoholic is? If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Here the authors, one more time, are emphasizing what is the real alcoholic and that the solution for being a real alcoholic is spiritual. So let's turn that into a question and consider that for yourself. Are you willing to believe that you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer? Consider that for a moment. In other words, do you have the power to conquer your alcoholism? Do you have the power to not drink? Keeping in mind what we discussed last week about conceding to our innermost selves that we don't have any power. I'm a real alcoholic, as described on page 21. And that Alcoholics Anonymous is not about not drinking. I thought it was. And how come you people didn't show me how not to drink? Because that's not what it's about. As a result of conceding to my innermost self that I have no power... Then I have a desire to seek a power greater than me, providing I had a first step experience. So you see, if I don't have that first step experience, there's no desire to seek any power. Why do it? So if I'm still clinging to the idea that I have some choices left, (laughs) that I can just simply choose and not drink. Well, see, if I can simply choose, what am I doing here? If I could just simply choose to drink or not drink, what am I doing going to AA? And one more time, if you believe that you have that power to choose, why didn't you exercise that power before now? I can't tell you how many times I've worked with guys, take them through the steps, and I hear the response, well, I chose to stop drinking a lot of times. Really? Then how come you drank again? Listen to the statement. Having the power to choose to quit to stop. If I'm going to quit or stop, that means I'm going to quit and stop. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to pick it up again. 
That's not quitting and that's not stopping. Okay, page 45, paragraph 1. Page 45, paragraph 1. Lack of power. One more time, they're re-emphasizing this again and again. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? In a moment, we're going to answer those two questions. So I have in my book underlined how and where. So in a moment, we're going to find out where we're going to find this power and how we're going to find it. That's what I love about this book. Simple set of instructions. Okay, now I've had a first step experience. I have a desire to seek some power because my life is so unmanageable. I want it to improve. I have to find some power. Well, where am I going to find it? Maybe I can find it in you, in her, in that boat, in that money, in that car, in that job. Right? Maybe. I don't know. Next paragraph. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. They're telling us right here what the main object of the book is. Now, I'm not the smartest kid on the block, but I did put this much together. Okay. If the purpose, if the object of the book is to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. Now, what is my problem? It tells me on page 23 what my problem is. It's my thinking. It's not alcohol. Alcohol was my solution. <laughs> That's what it was for me. It became a problem, but it was my solution. So, see, my main problem isn't drinking. It's my thinking. So the authors are telling me that the object of the book is to find a power that's going to help me with that. Now, they're talking about finding a God of my understanding. Not yours, not my father's, not the clergy's, but mine. So, consider this. If the main object of the book is to enable me to find a God of my understanding, what's the purpose of the 12 steps, considering they are contained in the book? It's to find a God of my understanding. That is the purpose of the 12 steps. Let's answer those questions. The, the where and the how. Let's turn to page 55. Page 55, paragraph 2. Page 55, paragraph 2. Actually, we were fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Wow. It's inside of me. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. But in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. Isn't that beautiful? That's where I'm going to find it. That's where I'm going to find my higher power my understanding of God. It's not going to be out there. It's not going to be up in the sky. It's going to be in sight. The authors continue by saying, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup. Just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. But he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. So clear and precise. Where I'm going to find it? Deep inside of me. How am I going to find it? By searching fearlessly. Keep in mind, to, to do something fearlessly does not mean absence of fear. It simply means I can be afraid of something, but I go ahead and do it anyway or try it. That's to search fearlessly. Let's turn to page 46. Page 46, paragraph 1, line 3. Page 46, paragraph 1, line 3. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. Wow. That's a promise. 
even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power which is God. We haven't done anything. All I've done in step one is conceded to my innermost self that I have no power. I cannot produce a spiritual experience for myself. And all I'm doing in step two is becoming willing. That's all I'm doing in step two. Am I willing to believe in something more powerful than me? And here the authors are telling us that as soon as we're able to lay aside this prejudice and even ex- and express even a willingness, they're not even asking us to believe. So you see, I don't have to believe, just a willingness to believe that I convinced to get results. You know what convince means? It means to begin. I must be slow because I've been beginning for over 20 years. <laughs> I'm still commencing to get results. Oh, that's great. And it's impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. Okay, consider this. In order for me to fully understand God, is to be God. So will I ever fully understand God? No. The God of my understanding? I will never fully understand that. Another thing that I've experienced in sobriety is that it is impossible for me to get closer to God. How many times have you heard people say, yeah, I'm getting closer to God? We just read on page 55, where am I going to find this fundamental idea of God deep inside of me? How can I get any closer than that? It's impossible to get any closer than that. It may be obscured by pomp, worship of other things, etc., etc. Now, as a result of doing the disciplines and doing repeated step work, I may have a deeper understanding. I may have a deeper relationship with the God of my understanding, but I'm not really any closer. Can't get any closer than that. Next paragraph. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. It doesn't have to match someone else's. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. You know what possessed means? Driven. I'm going to be driven. Once again, we haven't even taken any of the action steps, and already the authors are promising me, by having a simple willingness to believe, I'm going to be driven by a, not sense of power, new sense of power. That means Power unlike anything I've ever experienced before. New direction. Not direction, but a new sense of direction. I'm going to find myself going in a different way than I did before. Provided I took other simple steps. Paragraph 1, page 47. Paragraph 1, page 47. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. What's most important here is that it makes sense to you doesn't have to make sense to me. The God of my understanding doesn't have to make sense to my sponsor. doesn't have to make sense to the AA group I belong to. But rather, it makes sense to me. In early sobriety, I was having some difficulty and I was having a problem with this God thing. And I ended up talking to this old timer after the meeting. He said, here, why don't you borrow my... My higher power for the weekend. I said, okay, you can do that? I can borrow your God for a weekend? He said, well, he's been keeping me sober for 12 years. I think he can spare a little time for you. I said, okay. That was over 20 years ago that I had the same guy. (laughs) The same God. Isn't that amazing? This guy let me borrow his God, and I still have the same God with me today. What's important is that it made sense to me. Now, something to consider before we move on in step two. That it's essential that it be a power greater than me. It cannot be something that I can destroy or something that I have power over. The point is, make sure it's a power greater than you. I used women for a while and that didn't work very well. So all we're being asked is to have a willingness to believe A power greater than us. In other words, a God of your understanding. 
Remember what we assessed in step one, that we admitted that there was very little hope for us unless we had an entire psychic change. And that no human power could produce that essential psychic change. So that means I need to find a power. Okay, page 47, paragraph 2. Page 47, paragraph 2. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. When a mason is building an arch out of brick, the very first brick that they put in place is called the cornerstone. The outcome of that arch is contingent. It's dependent upon the positioning of that very first brick. So you see, that's our cornerstone. Our cornerstone is simply having a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. Let's turn to page 53. Page 53, paragraph 2. Page 53, paragraph 2. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? A couple of questions to consider. Did I become alcoholic? Was I crushed by a self-imposed crisis? In other words, I did it to myself. You didn't do it to me. She didn't do it to me. The employer didn't do it. I did it to me. That I couldn't postpone or evade. So here the authors are asking us to consider making a choice. Am I willing to make that choice? That either God is everything or he's nothing. And there's even a question mark in that last sentence which indicates that's a stop sign. That means when I see a question mark in the book, that means I stop and I answer that question. So what is my choice to be? God is either everything or he's nothing. So these are the questions that we're going to consider with step two. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask that everybody stand and we're going to ask two questions. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? So I'm, I'm, I'm either going to answer that yes or no. Yes, I do believe or I don't. The second question is, what is my choice? Is God everything or is he nothing? I will start. After you respond, please be seated. Yes, I am willing to believe in God is everything. Congratulations. Okay, let's move on to step three. Let's turn to page 59. Page 59, and we'll read step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. 
First paragraph on page 58. Paragraph 1, page 58. For this alcoholic, this is the most important thing for me to hear every meeting I attend. Where it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Notice that there is no S on path. Have you heard? There are a lot of different ways you can do this program. That's not what, that's not what my book says. You know what thoroughly means? According to Webster's Dictionary, it means to complete. So in other words, if I want to experience what the authors are experiencing when they talk about new power, new peace, new happiness, new direction, being happy, joyous, and free, being in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, the problem has been removed. I stopped fighting everybody and everything. I have to be willing to do what the authors are doing. If I'm not willing to do that, I will not. It's guaranteed. I've had personal experience with it. Not thoroughly following this path. Working half measures in the rooms of AA. So if I want what they have, I have to be willing to do what they're doing. Then they go on to say, those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this sinful program. Here the authors are telling me why I don't stay sober. Why am I happy, joyous, and free? Because I cannot or will not completely, completely give myself to this simple program. In other words, am I willing to ask God to take it away for good? Not just today, but for good. Am I willing to quit for good? Every single person that I've ever taken through the steps has had the same experience that Bill Wilson had. And this is basically what happened to me. It's basically the same thing that happened to Bill. As a result of going through these steps, I had a spiritual experience. In other words, the compulsion to drink was removed. I was separated from alcohol. And as a result of that, God made a deal with me. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I will guarantee that you will never, ever have to drink again. And you will never have to live it the way you have been living And all I ask is that you take this message of hope and pass it on to others. It's a done deal. To make that kind of a deal with a real alcoholic. Because I came in here with the desperation of a drowning man. I could not stop drinking. I could not stop hurting myself and everybody around me. So when that happened as a result of going through the steps, that sounded like a pretty good deal to me. And I'm here to guarantee each and every person in this room that you do not ever have to drink again. And you do not ever have to live the way you've been living. Now, it doesn't matter if you're brand new in sobriety or if you've been around the rooms for a while. Even if you've been around the rooms for a while and you don't like the way your life is going. I can guarantee you, you don't have to live that way anymore. Okay, let's go to the next paragraph. Line three. So we're at paragraph two, page 58. Line three, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. So let's turn those into questions. Notice that the authors aren't saying, do you want what we have? (laughs) That's a thieves motto. (laughs) I want what you have. (laughs) I want your stuff. That's a thieves motto. That's not what it's saying. It's saying if you have decided. In other words, have you made a decision? See, if I've decided that I want what you have, I'm making a decision. I'm going to do what you're doing. So the people that are new in this room, when you go to meetings and you, and you see people with long-term sobriety and they seem to be enjoying life, to have what they have, you have to be willing to do what they're doing. So I have to ask myself that question. Have I made that decision? And are willing to go to any length to get it. It doesn't say most links, a lot of the links. It says any link. Turn that into a question. Are you willing to go to any link? Then it goes on to say, then you are ready to take certain steps. Okay. Page 59. Second line from the top. Page 59, second line from the top. 
But there is one who has all power. That one is God. Did you notice my name is not in there? <laughs> doesn't say, but there are two. And one of them is Paul. doesn't say that. It says there is one who has, doesn't say most of the power. doesn't say he has majority of the power. It says all the power. Once again, I'm not the smartest kid on the block, but I didn't put this much together. If God has all the power, how much does that leave for me? No, I don't have any of the power. I am basically a foot soldier. That's what I am. The power doesn't originate in me. Okay, page 60. Page 60, and we're going to read the ABCs. The ABCs on page 60. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were sought. Let's turn those into questions. Now we're going to make a shift. Now the authors are asking me, do I believe? So ask these questions of yourself. Do you believe you're an alcoholic? Do you believe you can't manage your own life? Do you believe no human power can relieve your alcoholism? Do you believe that God could and would if you seek him out? In the very next line, the authors say, being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? Being convinced, convinced of what? Well, convinced of the ABCs. Let's ask that question. Are you convinced that you're an alcoholic? Are you convinced that you can't manage your own life? Are you convinced that no human power can relieve your alcoholism? Are you convinced that only God can if you seek him out? Next, the authors say the first requirement. I heard that there were no requirements for step three. That's what I heard. And yet the authors say right here, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self will can hardly be a success. I'm going to read this in the first person to receive some perspective. So I'm no longer reading about some guy in a book and his experience. But I'm going to turn it into first person so I can get a personal perspective. Follow along with me, if you will. The first requirement is that I be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, I am almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though my motives are good. I try to live by self-propulsion. I'm like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in my own way. If my arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as I wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including myself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, I may sometimes be quite virtuous. I may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, I may be mean, egotistical, selfish and dishonest. But as with most humans, I'm more likely to have varied traits. What usually happens? Show doesn't come off very well. I begin to think life doesn't treat me right. I decide to exert myself more. I become on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit me. Admitting I may be somewhat at fault, I am sure that other people are more to blame. Of course they are. I become angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is my basic trouble? Am I not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Am I not a victim of the delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well? Is it not evident to the rest of the players that these are the things that I want? And do not my actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Am I not, even in my best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? 
I am self-centered, egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. I'm like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. The minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century, politicians and reformers who are sure all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw state cracker who thinks society has wronged him, and the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. Whatever my protestations, am I most concerned with myself, my resentments, and my self pity? Of course I am. Selfishness, self centeredness, that I think is the root of my troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self delusion, self seeking, and self pity, I step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt me, seemingly without provocation, but I invariably find that at some time in the past, I have made decisions based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. So, my troubles, I think, are basically of my own making. They arise out of me, and I am an extreme example of self-will run riot, though I usually don't think so. Above everything, I must be rid of this selfishness. I must, or it kills me. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. I have had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but I could not live up to them, even though I would have liked to. Neither could I reduce my self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on my own power. I had to have God's help. So here on page 62 in paragraph 1 and 2, what we have is the problem. The problem is my selfishness, my self-centeredness. My troubles are of my own making. We all have issues, don't we? In sobriety. I have lots of issues, too. And you know what mine are? They're on this page. <laughs> These are my issues. Selfishness and self centeredness So, a couple of questions to consider. Are you willing to consider that selfishness and self centeredness is the root of your troubles? Are you willing to consider that your troubles are basically your own making? Now, that being the case, I'm going to show you a shortcut. The next time you're calling your sponsor and you want to whine about something, just cut the chase and call them up and say, hey, I want to whine about me, okay? <laughs> Instead of complaining about everybody else, but, I mean, check it out. I just conceded that selfishness and self centeredness is the root of my troubles. And that my troubles are basically my own making. That being the case, and I bring your trouble to you, who am I complaining about? I'm complaining about me. Is that wild or what? That is wild. And the authors are telling me that I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. Now, if I am driven by self-delusion, how am I going to know if I'm self-deluded? No, it's not a trick question. I'm not going to know. That's like going to a fish and asking it. What is water? It will say, well, you know, it's everywhere. That's how self-delusion is in my life. It's everywhere. <laughs> in other words, I'm not going to know when I'm self-deluded. Why? Because I lack power. That's the reason I repeatedly go through the steps and maintain the disciplines of self-examination and rely on people around me to hold me accountable. Because I'm not capable of knowing when I'm self-deluded if I'm driven by self-delusion. See what a trap it is? Yeah, I know what I need to do. I know what's, I know what's best for me, certainly. I don't know what's best for me. I still don't know what's best for me today after 20 years of sobriety. If I knew what was best for me, I wouldn't be maintaining these disciplines. By doing the actions... Of of these principles, they began to work for me. I wasn't working them. They began to work for me. By the time I got to the end of the steps, I had a spiritual experience. The compulsion to drink was removed, and my attitude was totally different. I didn't intend on sticking around these rooms. I just wanted to buy a little bit of time, get people off my back, stay out of jail. When I got to the end of the steps, my thinking changed. I wanted to stick around. Okay, so we have the problem in paragraph 1 and 2. Now let's look at the solution. It's in paragraph 3, the same page. 
This is the how and why of it. First of all, I had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, I decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be my director. He is the principal. I am his agent. He is a father. I am his child. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone. Here's that arch again. The keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. A couple of points here. Keystone in that arch. The cornerstone is the first brick. The keystone is the brick in the middle of the arch which holds it together. So my cornerstone, my beginning, is my willingness to believe in a power greater than me. And my keystone, which is what holds it together, is that I need to stop playing God. Do you have a partnership with God today? I thought so at one time in sobriety. You know what partnership means? It means equal position of power. Now, if he has all the power, how can that be a partnership? If you work for someone else, are you in partnership with your employer? No, probably not. You do the work, they pay you, and everything you need is provided for you. Is that accurate? That's been accurate in my life. Okay, providing that we do the solution which is stop playing God, what that basically means is that I'm going to do God's work. What is God's work? Well, we're going to find out. These are the third step promises. Top of page 63. Page 63. When I sincerely took such a position, the position they're talking about in the previous paragraph on page 62, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Look at the guarantees involved in that paragraph. It has been my experience that God does not have any favorites, but I'll tell you what. He pays his workers really well. He pays them really well. So, if I'm willing... To take the solution in the last paragraph on page 62, I will experience what it says in the first paragraph on page 63. Now, the authors are telling me that we were reborn. You know what that means? It means I have to die. The Paul Fisher that I know of had to die. Paul Fisher, the alcoholic, had to die so that my spirit may live. I'm told that I'm not the same person I was when I walked into these rooms. I hope not. Because he wasn't wrapped too tightly. <laughs> because I just was not really well liked around the rooms. You know, my, Early on, my friends referred to me as stark raving sober. Because that's what I was. I was out of control. My life was unmanageable. I was trying to run the show myself. So here we're being asked to make a decision. Am I willing to make a decision to turn my will and my life over the care of God as I understand it? Now, look at those words, will and life. We write wills, don't we, before we die? You know what a will does? It gives people instructions on what to do. So if I'm going to turn my life over to the God of my understanding, I'm going to ask for instructions. My life. I'm going to do things according to what I believe God would have me be. And we're told later in the book, in step 12, what our real purpose is in these rooms. See, the real work is not doing the first 11 steps. The real work is step 12. The first 11 steps prepare us to do the real work. See, that deal I made with God. 
he guaranteed that I'll never have to drink again. And all he asked me to do was take this message of hope and carry it to other alcoholics. Best game in town for an alcoholic. Best game in town. So now we're at step three. Before we read the uh, third step prayer, I'm going to ask those that are willing to participate to go ahead and let's read this together. Just to pause for a moment before we do so. And to give some serious consideration if you're willing to make this decision. My own experience with the third step was that I was never the same after I took the third step as instructed in this book. It may have been subtle, but it was different. It was never the same after that. You see, I'm making a decision here. That I'm going to give my life to that God. After all, he's going to give me, they just got through telling us he's going to give us everything we need. So those of you that are willing to take the third step prayer, those that are comfortable, feel free to kneel. Go ahead and do so now. Those that are not comfortable, don't feel obligated to do so. We'll take a moment. Asking for direction and care. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those who have thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Congratulations. I want to welcome all of you to the Fellowship of the Spirit. And those of you that are on your way to being rocketed into the fourth dimension, congratulations for what you've done today, and thank you.